pastoral nomadic peoples in history have really been misunderstood. When we hear the names of the Scythians, Huns, Magyars, Turks and the Mongols, we see them as great terrors in history, as the great destroyers of civilization, the enemies of all that is good, with civilized life. However, rarely we consider the complexity of nomadic cultures, and rarely do we ever look beyond the Asiatic steppes and the pastoral nomadic peoples that live there, as various people in the deserts of the Middle East and Africa, such as the Berbers and the various Bedouin groups, are also pastoralists that live a nomadic life, traveling with herds of animals that they raise, slaughter and live off by wandering from pasture to pasture, depending upon the seasons and upon the states of the pastures. And it is important to note that this is a nomadic type of Neolithic lifestyle and not a pre-Neolithic hunter-gatherer nomadic lifestyle. That's to say they still use animal husbandry and raise animals. They don't live off the land by hunting as the primary source of sustenance. Thus this lifestyle can be seen just as an alternative to more regular farming agriculture. Sure, it is not the raising of plants, but of animals and the migration with them across the steppes or the deserts in order to reach greener pastures for the animals. Usually the animals that are used in this sort of nomadic pastoralist lifestyles are horses, goats, sheep and camels. Pastoral nomads throughout history, due to living of animals rather than various cereals, have had usually more protein in their diets and arguably have lived a more healthy lifestyle than living in crowded cities or doing the hyper strenuous repetitive work of working on the fields as most people throughout the ages have been peasants toiling on fields. The backside to this is that nomadic pastoralism usually can't support the same numbers of people as sedentary agriculture can do, by creating a consistent food surplus to feed large populations. Thus, nomadic pastoralist cultures tend to be lower in the population numbers than sedentary agricultural cultures throughout history. The type of work also used for pastoralism requires the engagement of the entire family as well, women included. Which means also that nomadic societies that live upon pastoralism tend to have more egalitarian in-group relations between the sexes. As the work provided by the women in these societies are a vital part of the food production and in the survival of the family. It should be noted however that this is in-group behavior and gender rules and does not apply to out-group women, and especially women during conflicts belonging to other groups. And speaking about conflict, the lack of centralized authorities or structures of overreach and control in pastoral nomadic societies due to the difficulty in controlling constantly moving nomadic groups leads to constant intergroup warfare and disunity. True, this sort of environment of near constant conflicts together with a rather healthy lifestyle and skills of riding horses or camels that are learned from a very early age together with the availability of said animals to use in warfare make for tough and very capable cavalry based warriors the type of warriors that are imagined to have made the great and brutal empires like the Huns, Mongols and the later Timurids and some other great pastoral nomadic empires. Yet it should be noted that the reason why we hear so much about these great nomadic empires is that they were the exceptions. Sometimes there is this popular view of history that nomadic peoples before the time of gunpowder were invincible and could not be defeated by the sedentary peoples. However, this is a myth and the reality is actually the opposite, as history is filled with examples of sedentary peoples defeating or conquering nomadic peoples. 
You have various Greek entities winning against the Scythians, the various Roman campaigns against the Sarmatians and other nomadic pastoralists where they've won. You have the Huns, the Zenju, being driven away by the Chinese Han dynasty and later defeated by the Romans in the battle of the Catalonian plains. You have the various slave campaigns against the Turks by the early Arabic caliphates. You have various Germanic kingdoms against the Avars and the Magyars, where they eventually won. The Sami people getting conquered by various Nordic kingdoms, such as Norway, Denmark and Sweden. You have the Muscovites and others beating the Mongols after the empire began to crumble. And you have many other examples of sedentary people defeating or even conquering nomadic peoples. These examples and many more were before the time of gunpowder. So nomadic pastoralists were far from invincible even before the time of gunpowder. And in many examples they were even taken advantage of by stronger sedentary cultures as a source of slaves and tribute. You can see this in the, how the early Arabic caliphates treated the nomadic Turkic people of Central Asia before the Turks gained the upper hand and began to conquer themselves. And you see the same with the Chinese and the Huns and with the Romans and various Central Eurasian steppe nomads. The lack of centralization of power due to the nature of nomadic life makes it hard to organize a defense or coordinate groups in order to mount a defense against aggressors. This organization has be always been a huge problem among nomadic peoples. Sure, individually, a lot of nomadic warriors might be good historically, especially as they usually had lived on horseback and practiced archery from childhood and been in preparation for conflicts their entire life. But on a greater whole, the issues of coordination and unification and the lack of formalized structures of organization meant that most of the time nomadic pastoralists were usually dominated by sedentary peoples and not the other way around. There is a presentation bias in more popular history of only looking at the successful cases of nomadic pastoralist political entities. This is not to say that there did not exist great leaders that managed to unify nomadic pastoralists, people such as Attila or Genghis Khan, as it certainly did occur and these great leaders managed to create unity between groups and organize them into effective fighting forces. And once in a while, when you do get these great leaders that actually manage to unify these nomads, they have uh, some advantages that lead to rapid expansion. Firstly, they have a lot of skilled warriors that are also highly mobile due to being on horseback or camelback and having the ability to bring supplies with them in the form of their herds. As most nomadic societies are used to decentralized rulership, that also helps in the expansion, as most of these great nomadic empires were less about direct rulership and more about taking tribute from various areas, letting these various areas more or less rule themselves. As the formalized structures for more direct rule were usually not there for it. Sometimes this was even due to agreements as various nomadic groups could get involved in the politics of various sedentary peoples. Especially if the nearby sedentary cultures were suffering from their own internal problems such as infighting that while rarer among sedentary peoples were not unheard of in the past and still pretty common even if not to the same degree as among nomadic cultures. However, these traits of nomadic expansion, of quick, rapid, decentralized expansion based around the personal charisma of a greater leader, with very little direct formalized organization beyond the charismatic leader, meant that in most cases the death of the great leader was resulting in 
disintegration of the political entity and a pretty quick collapse afterwards. When the great leader is gone, there is nothing holding the nomadic political entity together. And if it is not a collapse that happened historically, it is usually the case that it was due to a transformation of the nomadic people into a more sedentary lifestyle, such as the Magyars turning into modern day sedentary Hungary or the Ughus Turks migrating into the Anatolian Peninsula and settling there. Sometimes this meant being absorbed into the local sedentary culture. For example, the Sephavids were Turkic peoples that assimilated into the Persian culture of the people whose land they had migrated into. You could even say that Persian culture generally is the result of several nomadic Iranic peoples migrating into the Iranic plateau, the area of modern day Iran, and then becoming sedentary. And China has had several examples of nomadic groups assimilating into Chinese culture after having conquered China. But now, my viewers, some of you might be wondering, but what about the brutality of these nomadic peoples? Such as the brutal terror tactics employed by people such as Attila de Huan, Genghis Khan and Timur Lein. Well, there are several reasons for this brutality that we can see in a lot of nomadic invasions. With mass murder and mass torture and total devastation of the land. The first thing that we need to recognize is that these things are terror tactics. And that is to say, they are tactics or strategies of war. To win war, to scare the enemy into submission or to eradicate the enemy completely. And that these things have less to do with morals when it comes to nomadic peoples and more to do with logistics. As nomadic peoples are not bound to keeping agriculture intact as they can move with their herds to new pastures and they bring their food sources with them. Thus destroying local agriculture or massacring the local peasants is no issue. In fact, keeping people alive in conquered territories might even be an issue as the farming fields could be better used as pasture for the herds among the nomads. In contrast, settled people usually had to rely upon keeping the agriculture intact of the areas they conquered as to be able to feed their own armies as logistics in the past often were not advanced enough to keep up over long distances and there were only a few rather advanced civilizations that actually could project force in a way that did not make them dependent upon the local land. Thus, killing all of the local peasants and destroying the land in mass slaughters and mass devastation of the fields would be counterproductive and even self-destructive. However, in a few cases of advanced settled civilizations, we can actually see settled peoples being just as brutal as nomadic peoples due to the fact that their logistics allowed them to be brutal in this way. We can see this in for example the Romans constant eradication campaigns against their enemies, in how the Assyrians treated their defeated enemies by mass slaughter, or in more recent history in how the various colonial empires of Europe managed to do a lot of mass slaughter in foreign faraway lands. There are also a lot of other cases of mass slaughter made by settled peoples. But in all of these cases, the logistical situations for these peoples made it so that they were able to employ the same tactics as we can see among nomadic peoples. So it has nothing to do with inherent moral values of these cultures and more to do with the fact that it just is logistically easier and more rational for pastoral nomads to employ these sorts of war tactics. Historically, there is also another feature of nomadic life which brings a bit more brutality into it. And that is due to the decentralized nature and lack of formalized systems of control and organization in nomadic societies and the importance of having access to good pasture have historically created situations of kill or be killed 
where your group needs to win conflicts in order to survive as a group and get access to the vital pastures for your herds. Because if you don't win conflicts regarding pastures, your group dies due to starvation. And this is also one of the reasons as to why women are historically seen participating as warriors in nomadic pastoralist societies. Because if you don't win at crucial moments, you are dead anyway due to starvation. Settled people can afford to keep their women locked away from the battlefield. And it is even in uh, settled people's own cultural survival advantage to keep the women safe as they guarantee the next generation. But winning conflicts among nomadic peoples when it comes to the pastures is so important that the survival chance of the group is increased by the women participating in these conflicts. Which also in turn strengthens the in-group gender rule of women historically. However, when a people is in a kill or be killed situation where the entire family is engaged in violence as warriors conquering land for their own very survival. This breeds a mentality that leads to great brutality in practice. Brutality that is due to the logistics of nomadic life. I could mention a lot more about nomadic life and how it has affected history in this video. But I think that this suffices as this has shone light upon some of the most important features of nomadic peoples historically. As always, likes, comments and questions are always welcome. Please do subscribe as it would help the channel spread awareness about the humanities.